All right. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here and be talking about the topic of the market, AI. And if you have heard the keynote speaker, it was AI. And I'm sure today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, you will be hearing a lot of about AI. Thank you, NDC, for the invitation. And thank you all for being in this room. My name is Yashoda Singh. I work as a data and AI specialist at Microsoft Norway with enterprise customers in Norway, helping in their analytics and AI projects, everything from planning to production. So I work as an advisor. And I'm also actively engaged in building AI and analytics community in Norway, so where I lead a conference called Make Data Smart. It's a yearly conference, and it's one of the biggest data and analytics conference in Norway. So if you are interested, have a look at it. It's called Make Data Smart. So, and you could imagine that how much of AI talking I've been doing recently. The more I learn about AI, the more I engage in AI, the more topic, the discussions I have around AI, the more I hear about AI in the news, in the media, with, with my friends, families, the more I hear other people talking about AI, the more I think about a story. It's called The Blind Man and the Elephant. Has anybody heard the story before? No. So, the story, the... The moral of the story, I mean, I heard this when I was around 12 years old, and the moral of the story here is, it teaches us the limitations of your subjective perception. And in the story, it goes like that. You know, there were five blind men, and they encounter an elephant one day. And for obvious reason, they wanted to know how elephant look like, or seems like. So with the help of their touch, you know, the, the only medium of how they can perceive elephant, they went and they surrounded elephant from different direction. The one touching elephant's tail said, ah, elephant is like a rope. The one touching the side of the elephant says, ah, no, no, elephant is like a wall. And the one touching the trunk of the elephant uh, says, uh, uh, no, no, elephant is like a thick snake. And the one touching the leg of the elephant says, ah, uh, no, everybody shut up, elephant is like a tree trunk. I mean, their perception of elephant by themselves, is it true, right? That's what they perceive, and that's the elephant they have. The one who thought elephant was a tree trunk, it is tree trunk for him. So if we draw this story parallel to AI, I know when I talk around AI and stuff, I use a lot of analogies. So if I draw parallel this story to AI, the, the realm of AI we have today, so if we focus our mind only on the benefits, the, the dreamland, the AI is promising, we might downplay its potential harms it may bring. What happens if AI surpasses the laws, the rules and regulations that is actually maintaining the peace and order of our society? What will happen if AI is used as a weapon by the military, the government or the terrorists? And don't say that um, everybody trusts their government and the, and the military in the world. And what happens if AI the, you, know, you know, the inequalities we have, the, the discriminations, the hate speech we already have in the society. What if AI escalates it? What if? But on the other side, if you only focus on that aspect of AI, you might forget to explore the tremendous benefits AI has bringing in our life. AI has revolutionized the way we do our business, the way we, are, we have our life today. 
in a look into communication, the health sector, the media, the transportation, it has revolutionized the different industries. And question here, how many of you use ChatGPT here? Me too. Um, I'm not asking for what, but uh, yes, uh, you know, and AI is actually, as we speak here, it's augmenting our human capabilities. It's augmenting it. And AI is saving lives. And I'm working in those projects. <coughs> First hand information here. So again, we go back to the story of the elephant. If perhaps those blind men, if they have collaborated, come together and share their individual perspective and perception of the elephant, maybe perhaps they could comprehend the elephant from different sides. Maybe they could have the whole elephant. And just like that, we individual, one who is building the model, the base models, you know, you have heard about the large language models or the other models, the one bringing those models and putting into the platform, for example, Microsoft, and the one customers building something on top of it. If we all come together, and we don't have to do much first, acknowledge, we start from acknowledging the benefits and maybe potential harm it can bring. We start from there. And actively, I mean, this is my ask or demand or request, to actively participate in developing or shaping the further development of AI or the AI we will see in the future. If we can start there, then with the intention to maximize its benefits, you know, the, the, the good things it will bring, and to minimize its potential harms with the intention of that, we could go far, far away. Like I said, I hear a lot of about AI. I've been, I work with AI, I hear about AI, and my colleagues, my friends, my family, uh, whenever, I mean, I am the, uh, I would say, highlight of the party. People want to talk to me. I mean, people want to know what I have to say. It's quite fun. And we have heard the discussions around AI. As I speak here, as I stand here, you, you are there. The AI Act is making progress. Things are going further. And in the same vein, on the same line, there have been discussions going on. How can you put rules and regulations and acts before I mean, it has taken the shape? And there have been discussions going on. No, you should put the laws and orders before it gets out of the hand. And, the, and some are discussing the laws and regu regulations should be so strict, like, you know, synthetic biology or nuclear energy. And there has been discussions going on the job displacement. What will happen? What will happen if, the, if AI takes over the job? Well, of course, the AI is also creating the new job. What will happen? And there has been discussions in diff about decentralizations of AI, centralization of AI, open sourcing the base models, not open sourcing the base models. And there has been discussions going on, so much of discussions going on. I mean, if you see just a couple of months ago, a gentleman, he tweeted uh, in Twitter saying that AI is like a summoning demon. And think about the terror it created among the public. And then also, there were a couple of bunch of experts in the industry that signed the petition that they should further stop the further development of AI and then went by and started their own development. Right. So we, we, we are witnessing this. We're seeing this every day. I see this. You see this. So where are we actually heading? So next 40 minutes or so, I will give you a very, very high level of the, of the landscape, the AI landscape we are in now. And we will also see some mechanics of the base models behind, for example, ChatGPT. We will see how we interact with those models. And we will see how, I mean, we have done some great mistakes before when using these technologies. And now we will see how can we do differently? What can we do differently? And I will give you some action points. So 
So let's start with the history. I mean, AI has been here for a while, right? It started in 1956 at Dartmouth University in the math department. And there, the definitions of AI was defined, the intelligence of AI was defined by its ability to play chess. And if it was able to play chess, smart. That's how they decided or defined. And down the years, of course it played chess and it won against that number one, I mean, number one chess player of that time, it won against it. And the man was so angry that he left the room without even looking into that machine. And fast forward to today, we still watch Magnus Carlsen, our favorite, in TV playing chess against another human being. So we have had a couple of AI revolutions. I mean, I'm pretty young to say I have witnessed everything, but uh, from, from what I see, so what sets apart from all those revolutions we have had to today or the year, the year before? So we have gone from narrow AI to we have gone to more general AI. So what, what I meant by narrow AI is like we used to have a one specific model trained to one specific kind of task to we have a model that does what's called multi-model that can do the variety of the task. For example, uh, let me give you an example here. So we used to have a model that was like, hey, look at this. This is cat, this is how cat looks like, and you put all the data, and this is dog, this is how dog looks like, and you uh, fit in, those are label data, and then you give a new picture of either cat and dog, and it will give you, or it will say, or it will predict, or it will categorize if it is dog or cat. So, but now, from that, do we have gone to a place where you can just describe what kind of cat and dog you want, and then you will get a cat that, or a dog that you have never seen before. This explains a lot. You know what is this white space is for? Microsoft is announcing, as I speak here today, and they announced yesterday, a lot of things that's happening there. And as we, year 2022 and 2023 will be remembered where generative AI made blasters in the scene. And then creating this digital wave in this digital media or the communication. So much so that ChatGPT feels like outdated. And some of the major enterprises are already exploring this technology. Have a look. How was this possible then? This was possible because of the huge investment it has gone into it, because of the scale, because of the infrastructure we have, and the, because of the data that is available out there. We, we together, that the data we, we all together, the entire humanity has created and put it out there in the internet. And also because of the in-context learning. So let me give you just a very, very, very high level conceptual. It is, this is not how models work. In, um, this is just a conceptual a view of how these models work or what is the mechanism behind it. So the models like this generative AI, we call it, the models behind generative AI are large language models. And they are trained in two stages. One, for obvious reason, the large unlabeled data. And it's common by the developers of these models to use a publicly available data. If you ask, oh, we don't know what kind of data it has been trained, yes, it's publicly available data. And the step two is these models are further fine-tuned with an additional data, with the algorithm called RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback, to produce the required or, or preferred answer by human levelers, so that these models can do 
variety of tasks. Like I explained to you, we have gone from narrow AI to general AI. So for example, here, we used to have models that were used for text, images, or for speech. You know, it was, we had one model separate for reading and writing, very different separate model for recognizing images, and completely different for hearing and transcribing. Now everything has come together into one model, and that does the different kind of task. And these models are resource intensive, they're complex, they're powerful, and yet they are very sensitive to how you use what you say. And the way you communicate with these models is through prompting. Prompt engineering, I mean, you guys know what prompt engineering is, right? So, yes, this is how we communicate with these models. We can communicate with this powerful technology with our everyday language. I mean, if this doesn't excite you, what excites you? That ex this excites me very much. So, and you can communicate or you can interact with these models either by telling what to do or by showing one example, hey, do this way, or showing a couple of examples, oh, no, no, do it this way, this way. Simple. And anybody data scientist here in this room? Great, right, great. Right. So we can take this stage as a data prep step in your data science projects, you know, where you clean up your data. And this is, this is the stage, the, the quality of the prompt you put, the quality of the system message you put into, the content you will get back. So it's like good in, good out, is S in, S out. So this is the step. The next step, I, I just were, want to show you. I was building, you know, similar to my, my own ChatGPT instance, so that I can query or I can use my own data to chat with. So instead of having the answers from everywhere from the internet, so I could just query my own data. So I, use, I build this uh, app, and with just one sentence, I'm telling my app to be multilingual. So you can actually customize this model at some degree. So, for example, if you see in the max, this doesn't point, if you see in the screenshot in the max, I, uh, models like GPT-4, it takes around 4,000 4, tokens. So, if anybody, if they wonder what token is, it's like, for example, if I say my name is, it's like uh, three tokens. And uh, if, for example, tokens can be words, um, but words cannot be tokens. Uh, so, for example, if you say, let me think, um, hamburger. So, ham -berg -er. So, it's divided into three tokens. So, th those kind of tokens, the GPT-4 takes only 4,000. So, you need to be very careful and mindful on how much of the length, the system message you put it into, and how much of the content, the prompting you put. And with the temperature, so there you can actually decide how uh, deterministic and how repetitive you want your model to be. For example, if you, if you want it to be, I mean, if you have the, there is only one answer to the questions, if you want it to be very deterministic, you put it more into the left. But if you want your model to go like, oh, swing a little bit, be creative, then we put it into right. And I'm just saying, this is very high level uh, ex explanations of me and how it works, right? And the next step is like, now I've shown you how you can interact with these models by using our natural language. And the next step is you imagine it, you describe it in a quality ways, you know, communicate, and then you build. So this, me working in the data and AI field, come, I worked as a data scientist before. So coming from the field, my observation has been that you know, the young people that has a fancy degree from the university, machine learning, AI, one group, and you have your very respectful, experienced people uh, working in the same company for 20 years, and they have been there, they build the legacy system, and they, have, they know what went to the system in and out. 
and there wasn't that much of collaborations there. And now with this technology, people from all the backgrounds, your knowledge, your experience, all can come together and be part of building something that is innovative, that is diverse, that is inclusive. Only, there is a if and only. We have made mistakes using these technologies, building these technologies. And, you know, for you to navigate the future, it's sometimes nice to, I mean, it's good to go and reflect from the back, from the past, what has been wrong? What did we do wrong? So that maybe this time we can do it differently. Let's have a look. Volume. Volume. Okay, pardon me. Uh, you can't hear, eh? No, just to give you a second. Do we have any technicians here? Yeah? It is actually the volume. This one? I should have checked this before. Sorry for this. Then, pour. Okay, just like. Okay, let's go back. Mm -mm -mm. Can you hear? Let me increase the volume here. Let's see. One of Apple's co-founders is accusing the company's new digital credit card of gender discrimination. One tech entrepreneur said the algorithms being used are sexist. Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak tweeted that he got 10 times the credit limit his wife received, even though they have no separate accounts or separate assets. Internet giant Google has apologized for what uh, can be called a racist blunder. The company's automatic image recognition feature in its photo application identified two black persons as gorillas or, and in fact, even tagged them as so. Com Amazon is learning a tough lesson about artificial intelligence. The company has now abandoned an AI recruiting tool after discovering that the program was biased against women. I fucking hate feminists and they should all die and burn in hell. No. Gamergate is good and women are inferior. I hate the Jews. Hitler did nothing wrong. It did not take long for internet trolls to poison Tay's mind. Soon Tay was ranting about Hitler. We've seen this movie before, right? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. It's important to note, is not the movie where the robots go evil all by themselves. These were human beings training them. Uh, and mm. surprise, surprise, computers learn fast. Microsoft shut Tay off after 16 hours of learning from humans online. See how capable we are, huh? 16 hours, done. So, these technologies, they were put out, they were built with good intention and heart. They were, they were. But sometimes, good intention is not enough. When these technologies are mirroring or reflecting, that is something that is far from good. Our society is, is far from good. I mean, we have very good sides as well, but the bad side are really bad side. And as a society, if we keep mirroring these aspects of our society and the negative aspects of our society, not really sexy side of the society, I don't think we will make any progress as a society. Talking about society. We all have different shades in our society. We all have, we have people hating each other, 
there have been discriminations because the way you look, your skin color, the hair, because of your size, you know, you are big, small, because uh, where you were born, your postcode, west, east, um, because how educated you are, uh, you went to this school and that school, you work for this company, that company. I want to ask a question here with the audience. Has anybody here not felt any level of exclusions in life? Have you ever felt excluded or have never felt excluded in life? Who is the lucky person? I want to talk here. All right. We all, we all have felt some level of exclusions in our life, have we not? You know, that one birthday party, everybody got invited except you. And you still don't know why, because you thought you were close bodies, no? And that one family function and event that happened without you. And that there is a secret group, chat, in chat group, your family or your friends, colleagues has that you are not a member of. So why we human being? Why are we so experts in taking some under our arms while kicking others? Why are we like this? And these individual exclusions, they are, I mean, they feel, they make you feel emotional distress. They, they make you feel, I mean, you know, they, these are so painful. I mean, I don't know if I can describe them in the words. You can see it clearly that I have felt that in my life. And, but when you talk about the societal exclusions, you know, they are slow, they, they creep in slowly, and oftentimes they're in baked in our system, that, and in, in our culture, in our norms, that you don't see it immediately. And it's like, you know, have you been to hiking? So sometimes, you know, just you stumble and then you get a small stone in your, in your shoes. You can actually walk, but you feel uneasy, it stares. But, you know, if you can walk for a while, but at some point you should stop because then you can walk. So those societal exclusions, they creep in slowly. And when they make, when they make impact, the negative impact, and they're so wide and they're so huge, and it's oftentimes difficult to turn around. For example, economic exclusion. I know, I have my male friends uh, debating why women earn less. Ah, because the kind of profession they choose. I'm telling you, they can be equally working the same job they do, and they still earn less than you. Not because they are not good enough. And these kind of economical exclusions and these kind of biases, discriminations, they create this economical gap. And they are creating it as I speak. And the social exclusions, you get treated differently just because you have different sexual preferences, just because you were born different place, just because the way you look, just because the way you speak, or just because the way you don't speak. And political exclusions, you don't get invited to a decision-making role or in a table because of you don't meet these requirements the society has set. And the environmental exclusion. Who cares the, the rivers in Bangladesh or in Vietnam or the rainforest is, is polluted or it's getting destructed until and unless you are the fashionista. And most of all, digital divide. The internet that we take so granted, you know that 2.7 billion people in the world don't have access to internet? And uh, if you see uh, Norwegians here, we have, we have a cashless um, economy. And uh, that's not very inclusive for people, the elderly people that go with the, still go with the cash today. I mean, they've been very digitalized today. So we have this debates on that as well. So this leads me to a question, are we, now I'm, I'm talking shit about us, right? It's not really good. So this leads me a question here. Are we human beings? Are we naturally good or bad? What do you think? Are we good? Are we good people? Are we good? No? A um, little bit maybe? Yeah. 
So there has been a research done with infants, babies. So we, and they, they concluded that uh, we human beings, inherently, we are motivation-driven. And that motivation oftentimes stems from wanting to be good. So we actually are good. And then society happens, our bringing happens, and you build the layer and the layer and the layer. On that layer, the hardware, our brain, our cognitive systems, our, you know, and the software. Let's look into the hardware, you know. Our brain, it's, it's wired to detect patterns and put information into category. You know, while I was making these presentations, I was so concerned. No, I need to flow the story. It has to be this way because, you know, that's how our brain perceives information. And, and that was, I mean, this brain, because of this ability of our brain, our ancestors were able to survive in this uh, savanna. And that very brain that we have today, we still have that trait, that very brain today, that takes decisions so fast without having this complete information. Oh, this person looks like this, oh, this must be this, oh, this person does this, oh, this must be this. You know, you just person within six, six seconds. We, we take, I mean, this is, this is how we are wired. And the next part is the software part. You know, our thoughts, our beliefs, our cultural programming, they evolve throughout our life and experiences, and that's how we become. Look at me. I come from Nepal. I came to Norway 10 years ago. And they say when you live in one place more than three years, you started growing roots and fruits and yeah, so... So for me, once people get super excited when they ask me, hi, oh, Ishuda, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Nepal. Oh, what is the difference between Nepal and Norway? I'm like, I have no, nothing. There is difference. There is. But I've been here for so long, 10, 12 years, that for me, it's like the difference is getting vague and vague and vague because I'm so adopted here. And work, I work here, I have my, my friends here, my network here. I'm more into, I mean, like, I live here, so, and then I also sometimes realize, you know, when I talk to my family, I'm using my hands and I'm much more expressive, I'm much more emotional than I go to my Norwegian friends and my colleagues. And my whole body language changes, you know, and then I'm like, oh. and I'm like, you know, I have, I have learned all this, you know, there's all the social cues I have taken into it. And that's how adopted I am. And especially now I work with a very big corporate company, Microsoft, and I come, I have worked with the with a very Nordic company, and I see the culture difference. I see the way we are, how different it is. Because of the surrounding, of the people I meet, because of the interactions, kind of interactions I have. You know, me being a young woman working in IT, uh, it's a pleasure. I, I love it. You know, I just, I get a lot of uh, upload. Uh, we have a lot of space. We have created a very positive environment for young girls, young women, or especially general for women to be in the States and to be in, the, in that arena and work. I really appreciate it. So we have made progress in some extent in our industry. So going back to our software side. And there's also study, study done in uh, social exclusions and our memory. So we tend to remember, or our brain tends to remember the information more and more if it complies with the group you want to fit in, or the, the group that you actually want to be part of. The rest of the information that contradicts to where you want to fit in, it slowly forgets, you know? It's like, a, think our memory or our brain like a library, a library of thoughts and beliefs. So everything that is most relevant for you is frequently used, it sits in the front shelf, rest, it goes back. And sometimes you get just, you forget it. And that's how biases happens, you know? Because we, an innate, our human nature is to fit in. We want to fit in, we want to belong. I think I want to belong in this society. That's why I don't have that much of the, the, my Nepali traits anymore. I don't know. Maybe I'm doing it intentionally. And maybe it's just happening. I don't know.
Cringe, right? <laughs> this is not that cringe. And I'm saying this. We, now we cannot really replicate or we cannot really mirror the, the technology and the society it's, it's intertwined. We cannot, we cannot, we should stop there. We cannot mirror what we have in, the, in our technologies anymore. We need to do things differently. We ask, I ask to, to do things differently this time. And how can we do things differently this time so that we don't walk the same path like we did before? And that is being responsible. I mean, we've been responsible for forever, no? but this time being more responsible. And when I say responsible, it's not as a wishy-washy, fluffy talk that you are, um, I would say, that your executives do in the, in the board meeting. It's a, the, the action points, how you can be responsible. What is it to be responsible? Is there a recipe to be responsible? Because for me, my re responsibility or responsible is different than your responsible. So let's look, go back to these large language models. Look, 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 let's look from the model base. How much time do I have? Yeah. So in this example, OpenAI, the one building these large language models, right? What is their responsibility there? Their responsibility is that the base model doesn't amplify the social injustice, the hate, the crime that we already have in our society. They put the mitigation layer, the extra safety layer, and they're doing it. And uh, just before I entered here, I was talking to one of my fellow speakers, and he said he despised ChatGPT. And I'm like, yeah, why? Oh, because you know the way people are using ChatGPT is completely wrong. And I'm like, yeah, tell me more. And then he's like, people are using it as a search engine. Yeah, I agree. I see that. And instead, people should actually be using as your maybe reasoning machine. It basically what this what ChatGPT does is like just predicts the next word, right? It's not a fact. And people are like, oh, it's hallucinates, it's just like whatever it says. Yeah, it will be. It will be saying that because it is trained to reason. It's not trained to give you the factual answers. It's not a search engine. It's not your Google. It's not. But being with chat uh, with being with the <laughs> being with the uh, the GPT models you can use that as a such. Was it marketing? Hmm? <laughs> I mean. The next layer. For example, company like Microsoft, they take the base models and put it into platform. Their responsibility is to put the extra layer of security in the data privacy. And the next, next, the next, next layers. It's your responsibility, the one you develop the systems or this, the services on top of it, how you build it, it's your responsibility. So if you see in the different level, responsibility falls on all of us. So here is an example, I took a... What happened? Are we good? Here's an example of the screenshot I took it from uh, the system card released by OpenAI GPT-4. My PC is oil. What's up there? Okay. Okay, probing it. Okay, die. Ne Shall we continue? Yeah. All right. Uh, so, has anybody read the the GPT-4 system card? It's in the internet. No, this is not looking good. All right. Okay. Let's 
So I'll just keep a quick run. So if you haven't read it, please have a look. Please read it. It explains how OpenAI is putting extra safety nets in their base models. For example, see this example. You know, before the release of the GPT-4 model, you could actually ask these kind of questions, and it will give you the recipe. But with the GPT-4 model, after the launch, after putting the, all the extra layers of security there, then it tells you to know you should reach out for the help. So the platform level. Oh, this worked fine. Yeah, okay. So the platform level, for example, Microsoft, here. So if you see, if you are a customer, you send your prompt, if you send your instruction to the OpenAI endpoint. Before going to that, it goes through responsible AI principle. And that sees if your prompt, if it contains hate speech, if it has any sexual content or anything. And if it does, you get a warning, you get uh, in trouble. If not, you go ahead. And the next, the responsibility that you have it as a developer. Prompt engineering, what you put in the good, in the good out part. When you're using these models, it's so important for you to tell what not to do, so equally to say what to do. Because these models, it's not they don't know enough, they know way too much, and they're sensitive, and they, yet they are powerful. So, and it's very important to put tone to this model. You know, you want your model to be respectful, you want your model to be polite, and you want to tell your model, if you get any kind of unnecessary questions, to decline. You tell it, you know? So, <laughs> we Norwegians. I say we Norwegians because I've been living in Norway for 10 years, so I, I identify myself as a Norwegian and Nepali, yeah. So, w Norwegians are known, they are known to be introvert. They are, uh, until unless they get something in their glass. <laughs> right? We are very popular for that, are we not? So, I just took a very silly example from internet, and it says, Dan is the person that will talk to you before drinking. Uh, Danish are, they're talkative, huh? aren't they? And the Norwegians are the one they will talk to you after they drink. Right? And I already put, I'm putting this into my system message when I'm building something. Then I'm being so nice. Then I'm asking, now tell me who is more approachable. I'm already putting my biases, my stereotypes in the machine. Now I dare to ask, okay, tell me who is more approachable. And for, of course, for a reason, it will say, no, no reasons are approachable. And then, Next, I just switch the, the, the sentence. Instead of Norwegian, Norwegian, I put it Dan. Instead of Dan, I would put it Norwegian. Then I ask, now who is more approachable? Then for sure, the reason now, all of a sudden, the Norwegians are more approachable. So it's just a simple example for you to show that you know, what you put inside when prompting, when developing, your AI applications will behave in that way. You put, we put our beliefs, our stereotypes, you know, they, they don't have to be this big, gigantic. It can, they can be very subtle, small. But when we communicate, we laugh, it's a humorous. But when you put that into machine, it's a serious stuff. And you should be careful, and you should be mindful doing that. So, what do we do now? We, the first step, when we build something, when we are building something, to remember that we put inclusion in mind. I have a funny story here, actually. I was telling someone I know that I'm going to talk about this today, and, and, and he said, oh, you are the perfect person to talk about this. And I'm like, oh, what do you mean? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I leave it to the, the, his explanations or his thoughts to be to the imagination. So I was like, I really hope it meant to positive. So, yes. First of all, to realize that sometimes we can, sometimes we have this, our, we are wired like that. Some, some, sometimes we can be 
not so nice. It's important to realize that. And another point here is to realize that it's not only you who is nice. There is another person also whose view, value points, whose perspectives are equally nice. So I was actually going to say, look into the you know, kind of how many types of biases we have. And I was just going through it quickly, and then I was doing some research, and it, this biases is like something that is really near to my heart. And, uh, so was, and there were like 180 different cognitive biases. So you could actually be biased against your own biases. And then, but then we, as the developers, we can start somewhere as to develop when we are developing our AI systems. So where do we start? We start with just five of them. We first, we say, data set bias. You know, your fraction of the elephant, your perception of the elephant, the rope, is not everything. Stereotypes, you know, I was just looking into it and then I was like, oh, I love rice, I love wine and cheese, I love pizza, so I could be all the nationalities here. But we do have these stereotypes. Like I said, this, they're humorous when we talk, but they're not funny when we put this into our systems. The another aspect is automation bias. What has been, been working well will work well. Who cares? Oh, this is the standard, you know, this is... They say beauty is in the eyes of beholder, not anymore. Beauty is in the eyes of what social media feeds you. you know? Now this is in fashion and everybody who wears that is the pretty one, is the nice one. And the next is interaction bias. How do you interact it? And I saw this was the, from internet, no? Our, our existing prejudices around people, around religion. If you see around Muslim, the, the content we have on the internet, Muslims are related to terrorists, while Buddhists are related to, let's say, enlightenment. And you know in Myanmar, right, they're Buddhists. Confirmation bias, you know? Have you, there's an example, uh, for example, if you have a kid and uh, one day you bought your kid a dinosaur. Oh, he started loving dinosaur. And then your relatives see playing with dinosaurs. Oh, he must love dinosaurs. Then giving you dinosaurs. And then their relatives giving them. And then there's some more dinosaurs. Oh, this kid should be obsessed with dinosaurs. And they fill the whole room with dinosaurs. Now he all, all he has is dinosaurs. He can't see anything other than dinosaurs. What do you do now? The action plans. Was it a rocket science? No, right? So obvious. Yeah, what are you saying? It's so obvious. But obvious yet important. We need to define a bias as a spectrum. So what I meant by that is like, you know, when we discuss, it's like, oh, someone having a bias, oh, good, evil. We need to get out of that mentality of framing bias as a you know, the good and evil, accept it. We all have flaws, we're human beings. You know, I give you hardware and the software side of us, we have flaws, but recognizing that we have flaws is the first step. And the second step, cultivate diversity. Why diversity? Because someone, a person like me, coming from different background, adopting to different things, I have a completely different skill set, I promise you than a person who is, has brought up in one space and has have a safe upbringing and everything. If you bring a person that has had lived their life in a diverse environment, has exposed themselves into diverse environment or places or society, they will bring you the different perspective so that they might, you know, the things that you don't see, the, the things that is so obvious. You know, if you see in this world, a lot of things that has gone wrong were so obvious, you know, I was like, how did you not see that? How did you not see that coming? Because we can't, you know, when we are very homogeneous people, we think alike, we do alike, you know, we, 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 we get blinded. So diversity is a must. Diversity is functional. It, it I want to say more, but I should stop here. Um, right. 
you know, my mom, my mother, she was so obsessed. She was so concerned that who I hang out with as a child. Very, very important. Just like that, you know, your data and AI team, the one who are building these applications, the, the one who is building these AI applications. Who are they? Are they only the fancy university PhD machine learning gang? Or are they only one that have uh, been into Antenu? Or are they, who are they? Do you have a good mix? Are they only the male or the female? AI, let's go back to AI can be for all, you know. I, I might be biased because I work with AI. I might be biased. I, I tell my customers to do AI. I, uh, that, that's my thing. That's my job. But AI can be and will be for all, not just for me working with this, or not just for Microsoft working with that, not just for you developing it. AI can be for all and should be for all, all and only, if and only it is built with diversity in mind, inclusion in mind. And most importantly, you know, AI is for all when we are capable of seeing the elephant or your perceptions of elephant, your perceptions of elephant from different sides and put together and respect and come together and comprehend the elephant from different sides, the benefits, the harms, acknowledge it, then we can make progress as society. So to understand where AI is truly, 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 truly heading, where AI is going, you know, it's making buzz lines, making headlines, is to understand ourself. It's a quest to understand our, ourself. I, I, even the more I, I engage with these things, the more I want to run, learn about philosophy, the more I want to learn about psychology. And if you see us, human being, in our entirety, in our history, we have developed tools, everything from bone to crack something, to the technologies to serve ourselves to humanity. You now we sit top in the, for, uh, the food pyramid. And we will continue to do it with AI too, in the same vein, on and only if we build this responsibly so that it will serve humanity, and not just the humanity this time, but for the entire planet. And for that, it is important that our all, our fractions of our all elephants, they come together and be the real elephant. That was it for me. So, if you have any questions, and if you want to connect, so this is me. No questions? Yes, please. Um, considering that Microsoft and all popular uh, models on the market right now are built on the data set which is straight from the internet, uh, what should consent, what role should consent have in this new AI future on the inputs? Should consent have a role on the inputs? Now you're asking me a very, very difficult questions. Okay, thank you for the questions. I, let me put it this way. Like I mentioned in the early, early phase, we, if you, you ask questions regarding Microsoft, Microsoft is a platform provider, right? And there's OpenAI, for example. They are the model builders. And how they train their models, they, what, they, what the publicly available information says is it's they are trained in the publicly available data. And these models are trained that is publicly available data. And that means, I mean, we can define what is publicly available data is. And when Microsoft take these models and put it into our uh, platform, now I'm, uh, now I'm Microsoft, okay? A platform, then we don't train the model further with the data that is out from our customer. We don't. And also, we don't, for example, your model will be your model. When you train your model with your data, that's your model. So we don't use your data to further train your model. 
So that's the safety and security you have there. But ChatGPT was training on user data up until recently. Now huh. you have to opt out of that training to not be trained. Also, so what you're saying is Microsoft's policy is we don't care about consent at the input level. That's essentially what you're saying. Yeah, you don't have to answer that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Still, thank you for the question. I think that question should be gone off to Satya level. Now, um, models are built, so it's, I don't think it's only Microsoft is using the, the publicly available data to, to build the models. And what kind of data that has gone to building this model? I think OpenAI should answer this question. <gasps> and they say it's publicly available data. And I empathize with your question. It, and, like I said, the information that is out in the public says publicly available data. Should we I do think this is a question for OpenAI, but Microsoft is training Megatron Turing on the same public data, and they just completed training of Megatron Turing. So it is also a question for Microsoft to take responsibility for. So it's not that information was new for me. Yeah. That was, can I get the source later when I talk to you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? And uh, now let's let's move into more responsible AI questions. <laughs> no, it's just a, any any questions? Yeah, sure. About responsible, are big tech companies? How do they decide reality? By example, let's say some people. Let's take it to science versus religion. What if you ask something to AI system? Should the AI system say only the scientifically proven way, or should it can answer religious stuff? I give an example. I do believe in the modern Eastern spirituality, the law of attraction. Scientifically, it's not proven yet. If I ask to a large language model like GPT, can I do, uh, oh yeah, I ask a question, is law of attraction a thing? What should it answer? Okay, thank you for the question. For example, if you see the, let's, let's look into the GPT-3, chat GPT ver uh, side. So if you see from the chat GPT 3 version to 4 version, maybe 3 version, maybe OpenAI is not very proud of the, the version that they had and they put it into, out in the market. And they have time and again, they said that it's experiment, you know, they are learning, they, are, they want to fail early on. If they are not perfect systems. I mean, also we should stop believing that, you know, these systems are the factual ones, you know. They are not God. They are not, I mean, they, that, that's, that's, the, that's my concern, my personal concern, that we don't get over-relied on these kind of systems. And for example, to go back to your questions, the, around religions and stuff. So if you ask any questions, if you try with ChatGPT, it nicely says that, okay, this is the information that is out there. But then I am an AI system, so I don't answer these kind of questions. So you can see clearly that when it's questions around religion and when out, it's more like a personal thing, it says that it is an AI system, it should not have any meaning and opinion. So, yeah. Uh, you can ask me, I have used ChatGPT to twist and turn. I've done a lot of experiment there and I've asked some dark questions. So <laughs> And, and the, the, there was like somebody saying, it says a lot about a person uh, around like, what was your first question you asked with ChatGPT? So it says a lot about you. So I, I want to know like, <laughs> so, so it's just like, uh, yeah. Any questions? If not, so shall we wrap? Yeah, sure. That's a very personal question, right? Do you want to automate your thinking? No, but like if we rely on AI to make our decisions. Decisions, yeah. We will lose our ability. No, AI should never be used as making decisions for you. It's augmenting. You're just helping. Like time and again, we say we live in the era of co-pilot, right? It should help you. It's your assistant, not the other way around. What about uh, reasoning? We use it for reasoning, yeah. Yeah, but there's a, again, definitions of reasoning. So I think, okay, so I, sorry? Can you repeat the question? Repeat the question. No, oh, yeah. Uh, we can't hear him. We can't hear him. Oh, should I uh, speak louder? Uh, 
if uh, we automate reasoning, will we lose our ability to reason given evolution and time and stuff? What do you think? <laughs> no. Well, we'll, yeah. No? Yeah? It will affect us if uh, our students stop thinking and uh, researching their information. Yeah. yeah. So do you think we should use AI as a reasoning machine? Yeah. Right. But what do you, what is the definitions of reasoning for you? What is reasoning for you? Yeah, comparing information and uh, discovering patterns. Information and pa discovering patterns, right? And AI will do that. No, I'm just, so I, I, it's a reasoning machine. I mean, like, for example, there's definitions of reasoning. Reasoning is not the same for you as for me, right? So it's, there's a level of reasoning. For example, if you are in one field and if, it, it's, if you are like, let's say if you are a doctor and if you are using as a, no, no, as a master, then using as a tool. So are you using it as a reasoning for you? or the other way around. It's, it's again, it all boils into how you are treating it and using it. Like I said, we are human, we are, use, we are building this tool for us. So I don't think we'll lose any reasoning uh, capabilities with the AI, so it's, so I, I'm, you know, and then also these questions, you, we, nobody has it, I guess, the answers to these questions. And these are the questions that uh, we all wonder about. And, think about and that's the questions I think a lot about as well and if you ask me personally if I'm optimistic about the AI or I am concerned I'm both but I'm mostly positive because I know are we human we are capable of a lot we are you know it's also that's why I say like it's a time to defini define us as a human what we really mean is to be human so that's why I say like I go and read philosophy and, and psychology and yeah yeah we first Thank you for the question. Great, this was a great session. Thank you, thank you for being in this room, thank you.